Now, the, uh, the, the, the program that falls out of this uh, comes to be called the Strong Program in the Sociology of Science. This is uh, attributed most notably to the, the, the Scottish sociologist of science, David Bloor. Um, uh, so, so they, they contrast it with Merton's weak program, and again, and I think the 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 sort of the backhand here is sort of deliberate, right? They're 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 they're, they're knocking Merton down as not being serious enough, not being strong enough in his thinking or in his sociological applications. Uh, so, the strong program, uh, in particular, Bloor uh, identifies four key parts, uh, uh, four key values. So, again, much like. Uh, um, uh, uh, Merton had his kudos. Uh, Bloor puts forward these four ideas: uh, the notions of causality, impartiality, symmetry, and reflexivity. I'm not going to go over all these in detail, but I do want to at least sort of gloss over uh, each, each a little bit in turn. Starting with causality, uh, causality says again, that the social conditions are fundamentally what is responsible for why it is that scientists think that they know what they know. But of course, that's true not just for scientific communities; that's true for every community. Religious communities believe what they believe because of social conditions. Uh, uh, political communities believe what they believe because of social conditions. And again, like I said, this is basically just a sociology first perspective on understanding why people make the claims to knowledge that they claim to make. Impartiality says that we have to look not only at successes, but also failures. And again, I think this is something that, that, that comes uh, deliberately from, from Thomas Kuhn. When you look at, at, at only the histories, at the successes in the history of science, uh, you get one picture of what the history is like, but you only get that picture by ignoring the failures. And when you only look at the successes, you get the sort of uh, enlightenment picture of everything just constantly progressing towards truth. But when you look at the failures, you start to see that that picture is a lot more complicated. So impartiality says we don't take one set of principles, one set of scientific explanations to, to uh, account for successful knowledge claims and a different set of tools to account for failed knowledge claims. The same underlying principles should be impartial between the two. Next up, symmetry. Symmetry says that the same fundamental kinds of explanations should be used for all different kinds of knowledge claims. You don't give one, one set of tools to understanding scientific knowledge claims and a different set for understanding religious knowledge claims and a different set for understanding political knowledge claims. Uh, all of these things should be symmetrical. The same sort of fundamental sociological tools should apply across the board. And then lastly, and perhaps most intriguingly, reflexivity says that the rules that sociologists come up with also have to apply to sociology itself. You can't simply say that, well, physicists believe what they believe because of these set of social uh, principles and social rules, and religious people believe what they believe because of this sort of set of social principles and rules. But sociologists uh, were a breed apart. You, know, you don't have to apply these rules to us. No, they insist. The same principles that they apply to other social groups also has to apply to sociologists as a a group themselves. I'm going to say a little bit about a few, few of these and, and unpack them a little bit because there is some complicated stuff here, starting with the symmetry principle. According to the symmetry principle, scientific beliefs are fundamentally no different than any other kind of belief. They're, they're not special in the sense that, you know, again, it, it, I think a lot of scientists would like to believe they're special, that they are somehow getting to the truth. They are somehow getting to the, 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 the fundamental heart of all reality. Um, it's, it's, again, it's worth noting that a lot of religious people make similar kinds of claims from a sociological point of view. Uh, it's not clear how you can sort of justify such an, uh, 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 an arrogant, uh, ambitious position. Um, so uh, if, you, if you want a sort of analogy, think about physics, right? In, in physics, you use the same basic sort of underlying physical laws to explain why some bridges stand up and withhold over time as opposed to other bridges which fall down and collapse. You don't have one laws, set of laws of physics for the bridges that succeed and a different set of laws of physics for bridges that fail. You have one underlying universe uniform set of principles for the ones that work and the ones that don't work. And that's what sociologists want. One underlying set of sociological principles that can account for good beliefs and bad beliefs. Now, of course, what do we mean by good beliefs and bad beliefs? Well, I mean, again, from if you're studying science, what we're looking at here is what scientists consider to be good beliefs and bad beliefs. Uh, so a quick illustration, I think it's uh, the, the scientific community generally agrees that uh, it's good to believe that vaccines don't cause autism and bad to believe that vaccines do cause autism. Um, you know, I'm not, I don't mean to be getting into whether or not that's true or false. That's not the point of bringing up that example. I just bring it up to say that that seems to be what the scientific community at large thinks. And so what the sociologists of science wants to do is to understand what is what are the sociological principles that that direct uh, 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 scientists to uh, to parsing different beliefs in this different way and to saying these ones are the good ones and these ones are the bad ones. That's what a science of science should be trying to explain. Now again, the, 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 I want to the the. 
symmetry principle is explicitly going to rule out any sort of appeal to the idea of the truth. Why do I believe it? Well, because it's true. Um, that's not going to get us very far, because after all, pretty much everyone believes that their beliefs are true. I mean, arguably, that's simply what it means to believe something. To believe a, a statement simply means to say that you think the statement is true. If you don't think a statement is true, then, well, you don't believe it, at least according to sort of most understandings of, the, of what it means to believe something. Uh, so we, we, we can't appeal to the notion that uh, a, you know, the theory of evolution is true in order to account for why it is that evolutionary biologists accept it. That's going to be, you're going to be chasing your own tail if you keep going in that direction. That's pretty clearly circular. So you can't appeal to truth. So what can you appeal to? Well, all communities have different rules, but related similar rules for governing their beliefs. So if, if, if we're going to try to understand how these things, different sorts of things work, we, can ha we have to take a look at local norms and local interests. How is it that different communities reward people for believing the right things and punish people for believing the wrong things? You know, if a uh, young PhD scientist is trying to get a job at a university and he comes out as being a young earth creationist, that's going to seriously hurt his job prospects. And, you know, arguably for good reasons. I'm not suggesting that, again, and, and the sociologists aren't suggesting that this is a bad idea. They're just simply pointing, wanting to point out, look at how these sorts of social forces are going to push people towards believing some things and against believing others. Ultimately, questions about whether or not the, uh, an idea is true or fits the evidence or anything like that, that's not really what enters into it. It's, it, it's the social pressures that they're interested in. From a sociological point of view, especially from the point of view of the strong program, the notion of truth seems like a metaphysical idea. It seems somehow otherworldly. It seems to go beyond the material world. Uh, uh, it seems sort of associated with notions of, of like, you know, sort of a God's eye perspective on the universe, seeing the way things the way they really are. That seems pretty naive to a lot of sociologists. The best we can do is sort of try to make sense of how it appears to us from our point of view. So if we are going to be scientific about the nature of science, then we have to look for the things that we can actually see and measure. And you can't measure truth. You especially can't measure how truth affects a brain or anything like that. But what you can measure is what a community takes to be true and why a community takes it to be true. That's something that you can, so to speak, put under the microscope. That's something that you can, you can analyze from a scientific perspective. Now, another way of sort of thinking about what the social, the strong program is trying to do is to sort of act as anthropologists studying science. I mean, you know, in, in this far side picture here, again, you have these Western anthropologists coming to this presumably Polynesian culture, right, trying to understand them. You know, they're clear outsiders coming in to try to make sense of uh, this different culture. Um, imagine the sociologists here as these Western anthropologists come and, and the Polynesians natives to be the scientists, right? And, and, and again, for the record here, again, this, this was empirical work, wasn't armchair work. So, uh, uh, sociologists actually went into scientific labs uh, to try to sort of get a firsthand take on how it is that these uh, 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 different, this very, very sort of alien to them community generates knowledge, generates ideas. Now, if you are trained as an anthropologist, you know, you, pro you might specialize in one particular culture, but the basic underlying techniques that you understand when you become a field anthropologist can be applied to different cultures too. So you might, you know, your training might be in Polynesian cultures, but you could probably study Inuit cultures using the same basic skill set. Uh, you would obviously have to know a little bit more about the local culture before you go off into the field, uh, but the underlying sort of uh, tools that you have as a professional anthropologist would help you do that. Now just imagine letting the anthropologist loose in the lab, right, and just treating them like any other kind of culture and trying to understand what are the rituals that they appeal to, to in order to, to, to sort of placate disagreements. How do they settle disputes? How do you determine who gets to make the decisions? How do you determine who's in charge? How do you determine what we ought to believe? All communities have rules and methods and tools for governing these things, and a sociologist wants to say that we can understand the tools in a scientific community as being fundamentally no different than any other kind of community. Maybe different in the details, but the underlying sort of basic ideas are still the same. Now, of course, the scientific community wants to say that their rules are superior to those of religious communities or political communities or anyone else, but that's true for pretty much every community. Every community thinks that their methods are the best methods, otherwise they would abandon that community and go over to a different community. So again, we, we cannot simply, again, if we're trying to sort of treat science objectively as or treat, treat the scientific community in an objective way, we can't simply take their word for it when they say that our methods are superior. We have to treat them as fundamentally no different 
than any other community and set aside their own claim, their own alleged superiority. Because remember, if you are studying each of these communities, every single one of them is going to claim to have that kind of superiority. So the question that a sociologist is asking here is something along the lines of what causes a belief? What causes people to believe the kinds of things that they believe? If we can't appeal to evidence, if we can't appeal to truth in the way sort of the, 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 the common sense naive picture uh, would have us do. Um, uh, and, and again, there's there's good sort of science, philosophical reasons for this too. We talked previously about the underdetermination of theory by evidence. Um, uh, if, you know, from a sociologist's point of view, anytime a sort of scientist says, well, we believe this way because of the evidence, uh, they actually would very much appeal to this idea that, 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 that the evidence is technically compatible with a wide variety of interpretations, not necessarily the one that scientific community is currently adopting. So they have to try to appeal to other kinds of principles, other things that determine what pe why people believe what they believe. And if we can identify uh, factors that ca uh, cut across cultures, regardless of the particular tribe that it is that you're looking at, uh, then uh, we might be able to get a better grasp on how belief works in a sociological context. Uh, you know, you know, some tribes believe that if there's a drought, you can end that drought by a human sacrifice. And, you know, again, from a sort of a, 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 an outsider point of view, if, if you're not looking at this as an anthropologist, if you're looking at this as just, as, as just sort of an, an average Western citizen, this might just look like a silly idea to you, right? Oh, these people believe this because they're superstitious, because they've got these, these, these tribal leaders who are misogynists and, 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 and something like that, so they, they sacrifice women. But that kind of armchair anthropology is really bad anthropology. If you really want to understand why a native culture thinks that a drought can be ended by a human sacrifice, you've got to get in there and you have to treat them at, uh, with a certain amount of respect and a certain amount of impartiality. You, 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 can't, you can't go in there judging them if you really want to understand what they're doing. And by the same token, when a sociologist goes into a physics lab and tries to sort of understand why do they believe that mass increases as you approach the speed of light, uh, then there has to be this kind of disinterestedness. They can't simply take their word for it that, well, we believe this because of the evidence. The, 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 the tribe might believe that the drought can be ended by a human sacrifice because they've been doing this for hundreds of years and it seems to have worked out pretty well for them. Uh, so you, you can't simply sort of appeal to that kind of evidence. You have to look at the, at the sort of norms that govern and regulate social behavior. Uh, uh, and, and, and and in particular expressions of belief, um, and when you do that, uh, you you get a sort of a, 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 a recognize you know, as you start to look at a, a variety of different cultures. While the specifics vary, the underlying principles are fundamentally the same. Okay, I want to come back now to the, one of the other values I talked about, this, this notion of reflexivity. Um, it, I think personally, not to editorialize too much my own opinions here, but this is one of the more fascinating aspects of the strong program in the sociology of science. Uh, remember that, that, that reflexivity says the, the, the underlying kinds of, kinds of explanations that scientists use to explain why physicists believe what they believe also has to apply to, so, to sociologists themselves. If you apply it to the physics department, and it works for the physics department, but you don't apply it to the sociology department, you're not really doing the job right. The underlying social uh, pressures that make physicists believe what they believe also have to account for why it is that sociologists believe what they believe. But recognize what this means. The, the strong programmers are basically saying that their conclusions are not fundamentally driven by things like facts or evidence. If physicists can't appeal to that to make sense of their own beliefs, then neither can sociologists. Um, why do scientists believe what they believe? Well, because of local pressures, because they of, of what it takes to sort of get a job, what it takes to win a Nobel Prize and so forth. These kinds of sort of social pressures, if that's what account for it, then the same thing is going to be true for the strong programmers. You know, if you are a young PhD sociologist in the 1960s or 70s or, or 80s, uh, and you're interested in getting a job, you, you, you're, of course, According to the sociologist, the reason why you might glom on to the strong program is because that's the best way to get work published. That's the best way to get grants. That's the best way to get a job. If you were working with uh, uh, Robert Merton's stuff, well, you're you're kind of behind the curve. You're out of date. So even if you think Merton has it right and the strong programmers have it wrong, uh, uh, you're going to go towards the strong program because that's where the money is, so to speak. Not literally money, of course. I mean, sometimes money as well, yes. But but that's where the credit is. That's where the, the acclaim is. That's where you get to do work in sociology. So their own principles are sort of forcing them to reject the idea that their own principles are true. Um, what they're basically saying is that fundamentally we're coming to these conclusions because of our own sociological biases. 
Now, I think for me, and at least for a lot of philosophers, in particular in the analytic tradition, this kind of admission is uh, uh, tantamount to saying that there is a logical contradiction at the heart of the strong program itself, and therefore no one should take it too seriously. Uh, but the strong programmers, and I suppose this is to their credit, stared this apparent contradiction down in the eyes and said, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, th th this is this is true. Yes, I'm not. What I'm saying isn't uh, true. What I'm saying is just a reflection of my interests. Uh, uh, the, the, the findings of physicists are fundamentally driven by sociological and political concerns, and the findings of sociologists are likewise driven by, so by sociological and political concerns. Um, this is not a problem to them. This is not something that uh, uh, they feel is, uh, should they're in, in the slightest bit uncomfortable with. Um, now, the, the, the name for this, at least in philosophy is called the problem of reflexivity. Any time a, a sort of a system sort of uh, is sort of held up to its own standards in some way fails its own standards, um, it, it's sort of considered to be a fatal problem. Um, in this sense, I suppose, again, I, again, I, th and I think I have to give this, the strong programmers a certain amount of credit because they are being consistent here. They are acknowledging the problem. They're just saying it's not a problem. They admit that what they're saying isn't true or governed by evidence or, or reason or anything like that sort. Um, they say that we're all fundamentally in the same boat. Maybe they get credit for being honest about it. Maybe the problem with physicists is that they, they, they're not honest about why they believe what they believe. They think that they believe what they believe because of facts and data and so forth. Um, so perhaps the strong programmers get uh, uh, sort of a little bit of bragging rights for being the, the only people who are sort of fully open and honest about this way of thinking. But uh, yeah, I'm going to tell you right now, uh, I think that this, this, this right here is sufficient, I think, basically to reject the strong program outright.